Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, uh, lovely to be here with you today at this session uh, at PeaceCon. Um, so I'm Katrina Gourlay and I work for Peace Nexus Foundation. And this session is on the links between renewable energy and conflict dynamics. And it explores, well, we're co-hosting this uh, session together with International Alert and uh, the, in, uh, the Institute for Growth, no, Institute for Growth, International Growth, International Growth Center, Center um, who, um, who have jointly, well, who have done a number of research products um, on this topic. And so what we'll be doing is exploring some of the findings of that research. And then we are very privileged to have with us, with us a number of speakers who have lived experience directly of some of these challenging around, challenges around the pro, uh, the, these projects, specific projects, um, from different perspectives. And so we'll be able to invite them to a conversation with us about their experience and um, uh, um, related to this topic. So uh, briefly on Peace Nexus's engagement in this. So we are a foundation that um, has as one of its ambitions to promote conflict sensitive, sensitive business practice. And uh, we have a track record of working with a number of companies on that. We only have one um, case, which is a renewable energy case. So that is one, one of the reasons we actually, uh, together with IGC, commissioned this research to find out more about the, the context. And I am wondering if um, um, we can already start sharing the presentation. So what I'll start doing um, quite briefly is go over some of the findings of the research that International Alert did and, and we did, uh, we commissioned together with uh, IGC. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and, and the whole point of this really is to see, you know, what is the impact and how can it be improved? So firstly, on setting the scene, what we know is this, this matters because um, there are, 800 million people that don't have access to electricity, and most of those are in already fragile contexts where um, risks of conflict are high. Um, and this is also an area where there is the biggest, likely biggest growth in electricity demand. Um, so it is urgent um, to address this energy poverty issue to invest in green energy. And obviously, as part of the energy transition in general and to address climate change. What is also necessary is investment in these areas because it's not, it is hard to attract investment generally to uh, relatively high risk contexts. Um, so we are here to be on the right side of history to encourage investment and good um, practice in this area. Um, so what we um what we see however is that the the sector is not unique i mean the challenges of operating in these contexts are common to many industries and they are, those same risks exist for the renewable energy sector however we also through this research research realize that if uh, companies do invest in the, the a conflict sensitive approach in the design many of these risks can be mitigated. And this is absolutely essential given how important it is to our future. So a couple of words on um, the research that's been undertaken. Firstly, International Alert uh, um, conducted this research last year on the impact of green energy on a number of, uh, on peace and security, but using a number of case studies, um, particularly in the DRC, and solar projects in Kenya and Morocco, which I'll speak briefly to, and 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 happily the the co-author or author is with us as well, who can speak answer speak to that later. Um, and we have commissioned research, which is just about to be published, which looks at a few other um, cases, uh, notably um, examples from Iraq, um, also Western Sahara and Ethiopia. So this is some of what we draw our our findings from. If you can carry on. So firstly, the, the opportunity um, that this presents, as I've mentioned beforehand, there is a huge need, um, but we do see that there is a great opportunity for access to renewable energy to also foster social cohesion in fragile contexts. And there has been research done on this that we can draw on. Um, some studies, uh, 
show, for example, that um, electrification or access to energy, particularly in rural areas or the micro energy project projects, really have a huge impact on um, education, employment, um, female empowerment, productive time usage. Um, so it is an investment in human capital um, to have this access. As I say, you know, it also addresses gender uh, gender equality. So that is based on a sort of quantitative study. We know that where um, access is provided, it has these other social benefits. Likewise, at a sort of more macro macro level, um, it contributes to uh, a large scale products that invest in the grid, for example, that they it's both a, a public service delivery of the state, um, which is sorely needed and can actually increase uh, trust in government. And again, if, it, the, if the access to energy is targeted to more you know, marginalized areas, it can reduce inequality um, and actually foster social cohesion. So both at the micro and the macro level, there's great potential for um, energy to contribute to social cohesion. However, <laughs> um, I, I, I would unfortunately, um, what we found in the case studies in both studies is that um, despite this potential in practice, um, there are many uh, risks that were realized um, precisely because of a lack of sort of conflict sensitivity. Not to say that the sector is worse than any other big land um, of, you know, sector that uses a lot of land, but um, for example, the Lake Tokana um, project, which we have a speaker later who can talk to, um, there, one of the common, uh, well, there are, there are a number of common things that repeat themselves in many cases. Generally, the, the communities were not sufficiently consulted, didn't explicitly give consent, um, and had perhaps not the right expectations raised in terms of the benefits to the community. So, um, so they, they didn't benefit directly sufficiently. Um, likewise, um, during the project, I mean, so not just in, in terms of the consent, but during, uh, they didn't benefit from access to win, uh, from the power um, or the jobs as, as they had hoped. Um, and more in a sort of macro level, the, the projects uh, benefited central government or areas um, that, that were not actually where the project site was. And so it reinforced the feeling of marginalization, in fact, made it exacerbated that inequality rather than addressing it. So I, I, I mentioned those three points in relation to the Lake Tokana project, but actually what we see is that played out in, in a number of cases. And I would just like to add that both in uh, Adama, Ethiopia and in Western Sahara, it was even potentially uh, more extreme insofar as the projects took place in areas that weren't directly under government control, even though the consent came from a different part of government, particularly in Western Sahara, the, the UN recognized representation of that region was not consulted in and didn't give consent to the project that took part in it. And it led to large, um, large pushback from communities and uh, lots of disruption to the project itself and huge reputational risk, well, re reputational damage to the company concerned. So there we see that um, a lack of due diligence and um, in the, even in the early stages really had a negative impact, not only on the communities, but the company and its operations uh, as well. Um, because we have such uh, a wealth of experience in the panelists on these topics, I will move quite quickly on, but they can elaborate. Um, so briefly, on the recommendations, um, I mean, sadly, there were a lot of common challenges, and so many of the recommendations are common to all the cases. So, and it, they follow more or less the, the, the design, the life cycle of a project. So firstly, um, at the very early stages, integrating conflict and context analysis in the due diligence process, in the design process is essential to be aware of these potential risks and mitigate them from the start. At the same time, that same process of analysis can identify opportunities for 
how different groups can benefit from the project and a much more intentional approach in terms of labor practices um, or designing uh, community engagement and, and projects around it. And thirdly, further on in the life cycle of the project, the idea of um, having mechanisms that can continue to engage lo local community as, as they get affected differently at, at different phases is, um, is essential. So for example, communities may benefit in a construction phase, but when the construction phase is open and they are over they, and they don't have um, the same benefits, then there may be rising tensions later. And yet the attention of the company may have faded by then on the community aspect. So the, the need for kind of continuous um, mechanisms is essential. And, and I guess throughout the whole life cycle of the project, but particularly in the design phase, the idea of, uh, of addressing both uh, the need to get consent and, and benefits to the national level and to the local communities um, that are directly around the, the sites is, is just central to any social license to operate and to mitigating the risks of, uh, of disruption later. Um, so, those are very unfortunately common challenges. Um, however, we also found uh, that there were promising practices and promising examples. So one of the cases, uh, which was a more micro level hydro, a case of many micro level hydro projects within the Virunga National Park in, in North Kivu, um, there this, this, uh, these hydro projects were designed with communities and with the benefit of the park and the local communities in mind. So basically to give livelihoods and to, to has a sort of sustainable source of power within the park. And because of how it was a relatively inclusive design process, um, many of those risks that I mentioned with these bigger projects did not emerge in the same way. Not to say there were never challenges, but uh, there the, the feedback and, and the community acceptance was broadly much, much more positive. Um, likewise, there's an example which uh, Peace Nexus has been involved in in Senegal with a large scale um, uh, solar farm, I mean, wind farm, um, by uh, Lekela, which is part of a uh, well, Lekela company. There, they had many of the same challenges early on, as in uh, dashed expectations of employment um, uh, with the, the local youth thinking that there would be more jobs, particularly after the construction phase, also issues of land titling and compensation. Um, but in, in response to those issues, there was an initiative um, to work with the, the local mayor and the local community about how to align uh, the, the local development plan with funds given from the, the company towards it and other companies in the regions and to have also a kind of dispute resolution mechanism built around the local uh, government to address some of the issues and including through specific projects um, that were co-funded by the company and, and other companies. So there again, I think there is a promising example of, of a kind of mechanism to address some of the issues. Um, so my takeaway is that just because green is good for the environment, long-term particularly, it is not necessarily good uh, socially and for local communities. However, it certainly can be. So it has the potential to be great. Um, <laughs> And I would like now to hand over to um, invite some of our very esteemed panelists to, uh, to talk to some of these issues. And firstly, I'd like to briefly introduce who will be joining us now. Um, from To represent uh, a perspective of affected communities, I'd like to introduce you to Sojon Bright. He is, um, works for the Current Environmental and Social Action Network. Um, this current is an area uh, um, of Burma, Myanmar, and uh, he has a long experience of um, working in, in response to hydro and other ele pro electricity projects for the current people or representing communities from that region. Um, I will briefly go over all our speakers before then directly, um, actually, let do we have time to go? Okay, good. So I would also like to um, say that following 
John Bright, we can, I will invite uh, the Honourable Naomi Wako, who is the, min the Member of Parliament for Musabit County and the Vice Chairperson of the Committee on Justice, Legal Affairs and Human Rights in the Kenyan Parliament. So uh, the Honourable uh, Member of Parliament uh, has been very active in representing, obviously, her constituency, but particularly around the Lake Turkana um, case that I briefly mentioned beforehand and can give more insights on that. And thirdly, uh, our Ricardo Ridolf Ridolfi is the CEO of Equatorial Power and obviously brings uh, the different perspective of a company and the, the, the challenges that from the company perspective that have been faced in, in a number of contexts. Uh, he has a rich experience from many, uh, many countries in which they're active. And finally, um, uh, Najib Bijali, who is the head of Peace Economies and International Alert, and who has also written the, the report that I mentioned a couple of cases from, who will be able to speak more to that and more from the, the broader experience of uh, research in that area. So if I start, um, if I may, um, I'm going to hand over to a, a question to John Bright, I saw John Bright. And I would like to ask you, can you give an example of a community you supported or how they were affected by these hydro power projects and um, how your engagement with the company unfolded and, and any recommendations you have for others based on your experience? Thank you, Katrina. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, my name is John and um, I'm from Burma slash Myanmar. And unfortunately, right now, our country is under the military control, but people are resisting against the coup, walking towards democracy. Um, for me, I'm working with the Solomon River community where we are trying to stop plans for hydropower dams in the Solomon River and advocating for alternative energy options that is managed, controlled by the people. And this is very important uh, context to know in hydropower discussion here. So hydropower are a very controversial issue in, in, in Myanmar, in Burma, because like in, in the case of Selim Dam, it is connected to uh, violent conflict, displacement, and human right violations. So on the, on the one hand, people like government officer, military generals, you know, some politician and investors, they think that they are going to build dams in the Solomon River and generate electricity and make money from it. So, so they, they make plans and agreements with state-owned companies from neighboring countries like China and, and Thailand. They just do this thing on their own without telling people anything. But on the other hand, people are dying on the ground and being displaced and their homes and villages are burned down. You know, the military shoot down heavy weapons to villages, airstrike bombing to villages every day. And because the military, they wanted to clear the area and build these hydropower projects. And things are going on. Something, you know, might be happening when I'm talking right now. Somebody could be dying or crying without food and shelter or running or hiding in the jungle. So military dictators, they are using these hydropower projects as weapon to control over and, and weaken indigenous people, ethnic people in the Salim Basin by destroying their way of life, forest, land, livelihood, culture, villages, and community. And now more conflict is happening because of the coup. The risk of, that's why the risk of building these dam in, in the Salim River is getting higher and higher because they can do everything that they want. Now they are in control. So now we are talking about engagement with business uh, sector, private sector. Again, you know, this process was not making sense in, in Myanmar, Burma. It was not fair. It's not fair, no transparency, because these are connected to recognizing the issues that I just mentioned before. Uh, you know, there has been some engagement and opportunities created by the World Bank, ADP, you know, these uh, big institutions. Uh, this was a few years ago when we had a chance to taste the flavor of democracy, but controlled by the military generals. So these, 
these you know initiatives these actions were not making sense at all since there was a no clear legal mechanism that can create spaces for you know meaningful engagement and inclusive decision making so um my advice for for private sector for company is that things that are really happening on the ground needed to be recognized in policy and decision making processes and given the situation in Myanmar right now is that we need the power, political power back to the people. We need democracy back to our hands so that you know, energy governance will be managed and controlled by the people. And, and, and these energy options need to be you know, climate friendly, need to support and respect culture and people way of life, water, land, forest, and companies need to support and invest in community-led initiatives, um, or you can say community-based energy projects. And we need to strengthen community to be able to engage more in decision-making processes. So, okay, now I will stop here so that we can discuss more. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I hear that you have a double uh, governance challenge in, in Myanmar, as in uh, you do not have a functioning democratic situation now, and ne not to mention the governance of, uh, of, the, of natural resources management and the power sector. Um, happily, that is not the case um, in, in Kenya. <laughs> and I would like now to um, offer the Honorable Naomi Wako um, a chance to speak. Is she with us? However, I do not... Uh, ah, maybe. Yes, yes. Ah, I'll, I'll great, you. good. Sorry, <laughs> I, my screen for some reason was uh, was not showing showing you. Great. So in that case, I'm very honoured that you could join us, um, because you do have this rich experience of how your communities, uh, we or the community you represent in Parliament, um, engaged with that the challenges of that uh, Takana Win project, and I'm wondering. If you could let us a little know a bit more about your experience and the challenges of the project, how the communities were impacted, and particularly what you think of the role of governments in in um, encouraging more conflict sensitivity in, in the way that investments are managed. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much, Katerina. Uh, may I also say hello to all the participants and. Um, uh, and also introduce myself a bit. Uh, I am uh, Honorable Naomi. You had already done that, but I, I am Honorable Naomi. In Kenya, we have 47 counties and uh, every county has one woman representative uh, for gender balance. So that is a great step ahead. And I am one of the women representative representing the interest of women in Marsabit County, which is one of the largest counties in our county, in our country. Uh, once again, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important discussion. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, landmass, the county that I represent is 77,000 kilometer square, which is a big county. And allow me to start by stating that uh, Kenya leads the green energy movement in Africa, mainly from hydropower and geothermal energy, which accounts for 73% of Kenya's installed power generation. That I'm sure you can clearly see that uh, we, are, we are doing quite well. And uh, it is Kenya again is the leading geothermal energy producer on the continent and the seventh largest geothermal energy producer globally. So I think in that area again, uh, Kenya, I think we are, we are doing quite well. Uh, that means then we are home to the largest solar project in East Africa and Central Africa. Uh, I will highlight on some of the ASAL areas that um, has this, Garissa, solar plant and the largest wind project in sub-Saharan Africa, Lake Turkana wind, wind farm, which is situated in my own county, as I have already told you. 
The Kenya Vision 2030 aims to transform Kenya into newly industrializing middle income country, providing a high quality of life to all its citizens. By 2030, in a clean and secure environment, Lake Turkana Wind Power is one of the Vision 2030 flagship project. Uh, as one of um, the people who come from Marsabit County, where Lake Turkana Wind Power is situated, we are happy that in the history of our life, this project has taken place in my own county and has transformed people's life. Although I know at the end of my presentation on this particular question, I'll be able also to touch on the negative impacts of the project. So about Lake Turkana Wind Power, um, allow me to give a bit of context information about the Lake Turkana Wind Power. It is the largest wind power project in Africa, as I said. A total of 365 turbines producing 310 megawatts to the national grid. In fact, this afternoon, before I left chambers, we were questioning the minister for energy, the CS minister, the, the energy on uh, electricity, ele connectivity uh, of power within Marsabit County. And he promised that within the next six months, Marsabit County will be fully connected to the national grid through this particular project. Uh, it is the largest private investment in Kenya and it sits on 150,000 acres of communal land on the Eastern shore of Lake Turkana. In terms of the experience of our communities, the project has had positive and negative impact, as I said, and in terms of the positive, I will highlight on the following few areas. There was construction of 210 kilometer road from Laisamis to Loyangalani. That means through that project, um, uh, the construction of 210 kilometer was done, which is of a great benefit to all the residents of that area easing access to markets and tourism also. So this, the tamaking of this road has, the construction of 210 kilometers has improved the lives of people and, um, and also access to many, many, um, uh, many areas that um, they were not able to reach before. Number two, there was also the provision of jobs for our people since the construction of this project. Uh, as you know, northern part of Kenya, especially uh, this particular part, the Turkana area and uh, Loyangalani area is one of the areas that has been marginalized for many years and has suffered a lot in terms of development because of minimal development um, and also connectivity to the entire country. But through this project, um, of course, lack of uh, employment is, uh, is something that affects the entire country, but it has always been worse for those who come from northern part of Kenya and especially this particular area. So through this project, lots of our young people have been employed. They have been given the opportunity um, to work in that particular project uh, and that has given them sustainability in terms of, and stability in terms of sustaining their families and bringing up their children in a better way. Again, number three is the community social responsibility, CSR, arm of the company, known as Winds of Change, has constructed. Are you getting me? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, the, that particular arm, uh, of company known as Winds of Change has constructed and furnished a school, health facility, water resources. And when I mentioned this, a school, it is not only one school, but several schools and health facilities that has really helped. As I said, again, because of the past marginalization, 
uh, northern part of Kenya, and especially this particular area, Lake Turkana, Loyangalani area, needed a lot of uh, uh, attention in terms of construction of schools, health facilities, and water. So this project came with a blessing and uh, brought a lot of transformation because people's health have been improved, school-going children have benefited, and, um, and through that now, uh, children have access to schools that are nearby. On the other side of uh, negativity, um, the negative effect of the project, uh, from the beginning of the project, there were local perspective of exclusion uh, that you have also mentioned, but 70 to 80% is, is, is local. And uh, that has been improved as the project progressed. Uh, communities have now, still of course, when something happens in an area, People have different feelings and different perception, uh, but uh, looking at it in a larger way, uh, this project has had a very uh, big impact in, in terms of uh, um, bringing on board many people because under item number three, uh, number two, I said that many of our young people and uh, locals have been employed through that project. There has been a conflict between the local community uh, uh, and, and the company because the local community somehow feels that they have been denied um, ownership of the land and they thought maybe they will own the whole, the whole project. But you see, we needed a bigger brother for that project to be implemented and for that project to help the people. And normally when, um, some projects take place, people have some uh, reactions that has uh, always been there. Again, there was also a fragmentation of grazing land for pastoralists, locking off migration routes and access to sacred sites during the construction phase. To death, there is a barrier at the power farm where people have to be checked before they can cross. And we know Africans who have not gone to school might feel that um, they are being denied a big opportunity of free movement. This is a new phenomenon for pastoralists, uh, and that is why there is that uh, resistance. They are used to accessing their lands with no restrictions. So all this has had some reaction, some negative reaction, and people feeling that their rights have been interfered with. Uh, again, intercommunity conflicts have also been increased as the company initially employed. Um, I think the, the, from the reports that we have, they may have used divide and rule tactic against the, the different ethnic groups living in that area. And uh, that has also brought some uh, tension between different ethnic groups. Some communities perceived the others are benefiting more in terms of access to CSR. So, well, that, that, that people feel, yes, there are others who are given more attention and others have been left behind. And uh, uh, maybe some more research needs to be done so that we can be sure of what is uh, really happening. And again, most of the time, this is one area that, you know, uh, we have the poverty level of the people is quite high and people's expectation is also quite high in terms of gaining and receiving some support. And also the constant drought that has been there uh, keeps making you know, these people very vulnerable and expecting a lot from any organization that comes around. There is also a lack of national and uh, regional framework on community consultation, such as free, prior and informed consent. FPIC uh, and benefit sharing mechanism. According to our constitution, any, um, any company that uh, brings an investment um, is supposed to give 15% to the local community. Um, and um, and um, when that does not happen, people feel 
um, bad because they feel uh, that they have been denied uh, an opportunity or uh, their powers have been taken away. So I believe the 15 percent um, uh, of what they need to be given the local community, what belongs to the local community is well captured in their in their rules and regulations. This means that uh, indigenous communities are not able to benefit directly from the project uh, because of uh, maybe um, uh, what I have said before, uh, people feel that they have not benefited fully because uh, of lack of national and regional framework. Uh, and I think as uh, one of the representatives from that area, that is one thing that we can put into consideration so that the interest of the community can be well catered for. Uh, during the construction phase, there were cases of increased gender-based violence uh, and, uh, and, and also some other, uh, um, of course, when people have some money, you know, and others might, uh, because of the power, they might uh, be brutal and all these other things. And a bit of uh, gender-based violence was uh, also reported around that area and uh, a bit of drug abuse, which is uh, affecting uh, mainly young people in our country. Question number two, what role can government and authorities play to encourage conflict sensitivity, green energy investment? What were some of the lessons from the Kenya, Kenyan authorities engagement with this project? In order to answer this question, I will uh, just highlight on the following few. Government needs to legislate national strategies for consultation, including free, prior, and informed consent. The, um, and then that define parameters for local communities, participation, and benefits from the renewable energy installation. Number two, the government should also require investors to consider their impact on local uh, communities beyond their immediate workforce, because that can really help people. Effective consultation and continuous community dialogue can help to manage expectations and, and communicate the benefit of their operations. Um, creating enough awareness, uh, capacity building of the local people and working with the local people will always help for smooth running of any new project that can come. Again, number three, it needs to support pastoralists and other local land users to have legal support for negotiating with energy developers and have access to independent conflict mediation. This will help a lot because the conflict that uh, began when this project was started is still ongoing and, um, and, and even some court cases. So doing this in order to prevent bigger problems will always help both the community and the investors. Number four, parliament where I sit should play its oversight role to fast track implementation of the Community Land Act 2016 and related legislation, such as benefiting sharing to ensure secure land tenure for indigenous communities, promote participatory integrated land use, planning for reaching several SDGs simultaneously in areas foreseen for renewable energy generation. Additionally, it needs to protect affirmative action funds such as equalization fund to ensure pastoralist communities develop to the same level as the rest of the country. I said that uh, most of ASAL areas have been in the past neglected and marginalized in many ways such that uh, such that um, such that much development has not taken place in those areas. And finally, government can also lead in um, in designing and enforcing regulations requiring companies to conduct rigorous conflict sensitive analysis and due diligence at the onset. 
few things um, needs to be done in order for any project that needs to begin in any country uh, succeed and also benefit both the local people and also the investors. Um, however, I want to conclude and say that um, Lecturkana Wind Power has benefited the entire country uh, and, and supported uh, people uh, and it needs to grow even bigger and bigger so that uh, Kenyans can uh, fully benefit from that. There is, there is need for improvement in terms of um, employment, in terms of conflict management, in terms of good working relationship with both the political leaders and opinion leaders on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Honorable Naomi. That's such a comprehensive overview, both of the benefits and the challenges, but also that clearly there are a number of uh, pathways uh, for different actors to take um, to, to make improvements. I, I see that uh, the challenge of inclusive benefits from these projects is the one that everybody is dealing with, um, but I have a sense that uh, there, um, there have been many positive benefits and there has been a lot of learning already from this case. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Uh, I'll now turn to um, Ricardo Ridolfi. Um, as I mentioned, he's the CEO um, of Equatorial Power. And can you mention, or can we just give one example of how conflict dynamics have influenced some of your projects and then how you take these conflict dynamics into consideration when you're planning and implementing projects? Over to you, Ricardo. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, everybody. So obviously mine will be a slightly different lens. I mean, I think what Equatorial Power does, we, we invest in distributed and integrated infrastructure for service, meaning that we go to areas that are unserved and we deliver renewable energy assets, but, but we don't believe so much in electricity as much as what electricity does. So we, we invest, we have asset financing to enable people to earn electricity from, from a cost to a benefit. Um, we've invested in processing hubs. We purify water, make ice, uh, again, processing units, we've uh, rolled out EVs and we're pushing the agenda further because we believe that the value, the value that we seek to uh, tap into uh, are people. So we say, okay, how many people can we serve for how long? And so it is in our interest being these people poor to help them develop as much as, as possible within, within reason. So the golden thread for us is what infrastructure powered by electricity can enable our customers to do better. Right, so that 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 gives you the lens um, behind which we look at it. So it's very different from a project such as the Turkana uh, Wind or any other large project because you know our value is the customers, is the community, right? So our communities range from sort of a couple hundred households, say a thousand people, to uh, you know in excess of a million people when we're looking at some projects in DRC. But it is inherently um, ground up um, and and consumer centric, I would say. So. So that, that's a fundamental difference. So I'm not trying to make a comparison. What's what's you know better? Something's better than something else. I think I also sit on the board of Umeme, which is Uganda's national electricity utility and the only profitable distribution company on the continent. Um, so I've you know both perspectives, and I think you you need a bit of both. You need a mix, right? Now uh, I can't speak to issues. Uh, uh, you know, in, in more in in different scenarios where th there might be an active war, you know, that there are other considerations that go beyond, in my view, the, the nexus to anything in renewable energy. I mean, the geopolitics. I mean, today, you know, what's the benefit of renewable energy for Ukraine? Uh, I would say, uh, until until it gets hit by a missile, the fact that you don't need to fuel it, right? But beyond that, there are overarching considerations that that I, I wouldn't even speak to a nexus. in In our context, in our context. Um, I mean, we, we have projects in Uganda, in Rwanda, DRC, and now Ethiopia. Um, at least, you know, at least half of those countries have been recently uh, and currently uh, involved in conflicts, uh, at a, again, at a national level. So I'm talking armed conflict. Uh, but, but the conflict that we see uh, more often is, is not an armed conflict. It's generally uh, a conflict of interest between what is the interest uh, at the national level, what is the interest of a community, or also what is the long-term interest of, of a community versus the short-term interest of a community. And, and what I mean by that is that um, without 
an infrastructure backbone, which need not be centralized, but, but needs to be there. It is difficult um, for certain areas of a country or communities to develop beyond, let's call it subsistence uh, farming or other. Um, and, but that comes like anything else that is long term, um, it comes at a compromise, right? Um, you cannot uh, have free electricity and, and free services, uh, even if you're poor, uh, because simply put, there is not enough subsidy today to electrify 700 million plus Africans, if we're talking about Africa. Uh, that number grows if you go globally, of course. So, you know, the paradox is that uh, in some areas, uh, an off-grid energy tariff is, is five times uh, what it would be in the capital, and people are obviously richer in the capital. But the point is, um, so so we've become we've become I think accustomed to looking at things uh, not more cynically but more pragmatically, where sort of the excellent is the enemy of the good, and and if you ever want to get to excellent, you have to iterate whatever good solution, um, and that and that's an important concept because uh, especially in infrastructure it is almost impossible to make everybody happy always. Um, and I think that's an important starting position. Now, that said, that said, we've learned, so if you if you want to go into examples, I have many, but, but generally speaking, there's sort of three layers of conflict the way we see it. The first is sort of at a, at a national level, there are areas that don't, you know, people don't, don't get along with each other, okay? And, and generally that's uh, for one reason or another, with, with a few exceptions uh, to do with eth ethnicity and religion, generally it comes down to resource scarcity. Okay, so offering people that, that have less uh, an opportunity to make more um, it is definitely a plus and is definitely um, something that enables um, a reduction of conflict. So uh, because we, yes, we deliver renewable energy electrons, but we also enable productivity. So overall, my target as an entrepreneur is to target an area and make sure that with my intervention, gradually the people become richer and are able to consume more services uh, so that you know we try as much as possible to align interest and incentive to say, okay, uh, the country wants to increase its electrification rate. Uh, one of the issues, I know Kenya very well, and in Kenya quite often, one of the issues with large projects like Tukana, or like large dams, is that the communities nearby are generally, they get to see this massive infrastructure and these transmission lines, but they still don't get electricity until years or decades later, right? And that's not because there's a big bag company or big bag government, it's just because national planning uh, works differently, and, and perhaps necessarily so. But again, and that, that's a disclaimer to say that my lens is, is, is easier because we, we target the community. So of course, one of my projects will be more welcome by the community than, than a big behemoth that doesn't give direct benefit, right? So, um, but that said, we, we've learned all this. So the first is that by, by increasing economic opportunity, which generally, I think there's a direct co correlation between access to electricity and renewable electricity at that um, and economic development, then there is a natural conflict reduction. The second, uh, the second layer I'd say is, but, is among the community itself. So there are uh, int differing interests. There are certain people that have access to certain opportunities and there's a tendency to maintain that, I wouldn't call it monopolistic behavior, but but that that advantage, right? And so uh, one of the effects that I personally uh, like of delivering the infrastructure we deliver is that there's a, there's a I mean, equalizing is, is a bit ambitious, but there is a tendency to offer more opportunity to more people um, and it has, a direct benefit uh, on, on gender parity, because in some areas uh, more than others, uh, there's a lot of gender-based violence. Um, I mean, we, we operate on some islands in Lake Victoria where the HIV rate is you know in excess of 40% and there's active sex for fish trade, right? Other areas in DRC where, you know, literally if you're a young woman, unless you marry well, I mean, you know, God be with you, uh, whether you're religious or not. I mean, so, with, without going into detail, that's not my expertise, but but what we've seen driven by data is that by not only bringing electricity with all the obvious aspects that have been listed, so economic development, uh, security and all of that, there are other more, more endemic changes whereby you're creating the opportunity for small and micro businesses to be born. And a lot of those are women run. So that's quite a nice effect within within 12 months 
from us delivering infrastructure and the ancillary services that I described, you see a lot more youth and women um, launching their own micro businesses and employing peers. So that's something that wouldn't exist. Otherwise, you'd have sort of generally speaking, and again, ge generalizations are dangerous, but but indulge me, generally, generally speaking, the, the, the money, whatever small amount that is, will end up with the head of the family, which is generally a man. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the first bit of that income will go to shall we say, entertainment to be PC. But the truth is, um, you know, feeding the family and investing for the family is not always the first priority. Whereas when, it's just like the story of microfinance, when you enable women, that you turn that on its head. And so we, because my business is growing my customer's wallet um, and therefore their demand over the next 30 years, um, I have to do whatever I can in the first couple of years to accelerate that because investors are, you know, notoriously impatient. So, so that... You know, there are so within the community, we've seen an equalization effect, if I if I may use that term, whereby by offering not just electricity, but opportunity that comes thanks to that electricity. And that's why it's very important to not stop at electrons. I mean, I always like to say, you know, analogy is a king so or queen, right? Uh, you can't even see electrons. All you can do is electrocute yourself, right? You need to do something with the electron to enable community. So the, and, the th and the third layer, and I think this is where everyone kind of I think there's a big learning curve and that's the conflict um, between the community and ourselves as a any external party, right? Um, and sometimes you arrive thinking, look, you know best and you're doing the, the right thing, but, but it's not true. Now, again, the caveat is we start from engaging communities. I mean, we 100% of our staff is community born and bred, you know, with the exception of some regional managers that, that don't live there. Um, it, it's 100%, uh, whether it's customer care agents or electricians, uh, we we train, we take a lot of time in training uh, people from communities because what we've seen is, for example, we, we've been able to reduce uh, OPEX budgets, uh, not just because people are local, but because we don't need security. I mean, the community uh, takes ownership of the asset, right? Um, it's a bit different when you're serving multiple communities and you have bigger assets. So again, there's a difference between Turkana and what, and what we do. But but the truth is, um, you know, the, the truth is that people understand if you take the time to to sit with them and and again I personally I mean I've I, you know I've grown up um, in and out of Africa since I was seven uh, in rural Africa so you know I I think I know more about because of what I've been doing for the last 10 years about what communities tend to want uh, than, than the average person but even then we're always learning right and uh, and sometimes sometimes to be fair um, what communities want is not what we can provide um, I mean just to, to make a joke, but also make an example, my last community hearing on, on our most successful site where we've deployed not only uh, 600 kilowatts of solar, but we have an industrial park that purifies water, makes ice, processes fish, we have electric vehicles. I mean, it, it's quite a success story. Um, you know, my last community hearing, I asked the community, what did what they want next? And their answer was Champions League, right? By 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 votation. So so that's, that, that, I'm not, I'm nobody to say you, you shouldn't want that. I want that, right? But um, but that's not our business, right? So we always have to try and navigate uh, desires versus the matrix, which is what can we offer, what is in our long-term interest, and what suits the community. And sometimes we find that, you know, education, for example, on offering clean drinking water is a, is a fundamental step, right? Um, I mean, I've got plenty of examples between, uh, you know, you step on the wrong feet, so you, you roll something out, and then the powers that be, whether they're national or or local, uh, boycott the project because they didn't get a free ride, right? So uh, often it just takes a little extra layer of engagement, we've learned uh, every single time. And, and you cannot always uh, find the shortcut to, to making everybody happy. I think in time, people understand, and there's, there's always a bit of attrition at the beginning between what, what is maybe a aspirational expectation versus what is the reality that a small company like mine can, can offer. Um, but I always like to describe it as a partnership, and like all partnership or, or relationships, there are good days and bad days. Uh, but on average, I think the key element from where we not only come at it vis-a-vis -vis the community, but um, in terms of why we're doing this, and when I speak to investors that might sit you know, in London or New York or Paris, and that is that today, if you're in Europe uh, and you're an electricity company, you're willing to spend in excess of 300 euros to harass people on the phone to steal a customer from one company to the other. Nobody's willing to give me 300 euros for one of my customers in DRC today. But 
if you enable this customer to grow, uh, perhaps it's not 300, but it, it could be closer to $100 in the next 15 years. So what I'm saying is it depends who my audience is, but by being close to my customer and therefore resolving conflict by aligning long-term interest, inevitably you'll have some, some short-term issues, but the more you're able to align long-term interest, then I think the easier it becomes. And so that's been my experience. More than happy to to you know tell stories, uh, but I think that gives an an idea of how we look at things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that your experience is clearly rich, and what I take from it is you're absolutely the 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 approach is an engagement one, as in you've gone you go through it with the community, um, and uh, and through and build relationships and a customer and a market and a, and a customer base through that. So it, that is quite different from a, um, a, a larger scale investments for sure. And it sounds very um, well, impressive. <laughs> so congratulations. And let me um, lastly, but certainly not least, I'm going to hand over to Najib Bajali, who's, it, who's been a long-term, well, international alert and Najib has been a long-term colleague in terms of researching these issues. And I would like to hand over um, to particularly talk about um, how, based on your, well, what you've just heard and your research, what do you think some of the best practices are to, uh, you know, to address some of these inherent challenges? I mean, there, there's no perfect solution, um, particularly related to, to green energy pro um, projects. Um, and particularly, how can you just, in how you work and maximize the chance of them actually contributing, you know, addressing some of these, these different kind of divisive effects and contribute to the more um, connecting effects. So improving cohesion. Over to you, Najib. Thank you, Katrina. And, and it's a real honor to be with you all. Um, I, I have a hard job of following mm -hmm. all these brilliant speakers. So I'll, I'll try my best to um, yeah, do, do fair to that to that question. Um, so I think maybe be, you know just a couple of sentences be, before I start on what are some of the key kind of lessons for success and, and the best practices. I think it's essential that we 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 I thought we I don't think we can state that enough that you know it's uh, renewable energy and re renewable energy investment and green energy in general is essential for all of us for our survival for the sustainability of this planet and it's, it's also essential that we we get this right we don't get it wrong and we don't repeat the same practices um, of the past of other industrial experiment or industrial uh, expansions that that our planet has has witnessed so i think that's is important for us to state maybe one, one more time that the, the, i don't think any of us is arguing arguing against green energy energy here. I think what we are arguing for is green energy and that we uh, are able to maximize the benefit of, of green energy. Um, so yeah, I think I think what we've heard from 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 my from my other from the other panelists is, is, is extremely rich. And I think I, I, I probably I can start by distilling maybe what are some of the key uh, ingredients for success if 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 we want to call it that in ensuring that these green energy investment are delivering uh, uh, on the promise that they are giving us a more sustainable future, but not only on the environmental front, but also on the social fronts to ensure that they're not exacerbating conflict, that they are delivering on, on, on social benefit, that they are protecting people. And, and, in, and in that sense, and uh, there's, there wasn't much in what Ricardo said that I disagree with, but I think the one thing that I would say is that Success here is not making uh, people happy, but making them safe and ensure that they're enjoying their essential right uh, 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 when these investments are taking place. Um, so I think I think one of the key one of the key themes that we've heard throughout all the speakers is the the essential of having the understanding of conflict of the local context and how that integrates with the nature of the operations with the nature of these renewable energy. Uh, project. This, this is extremely essential, and I, thought, I don't think any business can assume that operating in areas affected by conflict is business as usual. I don't think that's not an acceptable uh, a starting point. It is a different context. That you, you, there, there are a number of issues here that 
the business that the projects need to be aware of and having that understanding at the outset is, is absolutely non-negotiable. It's essential to ensure that these, these projects are successful. Um, and again, I think that all speakers have mentioned uh, uh, that close relationship with local communities, the, the ongoing engagement with local communities uh, at the pre-investment stage, but also as the project progresses through through its different stages. And it's important to, to, to be able to manage expectations, to manage the perception of that project. I think Honorable Naomi mentioned about um, perceptions of different communities, about their lands, about the perceptions of the jobs that will be created by these investments. When they see this big infrastructural project rocking up in their areas, they have big expectations. So it's important to have those on this ongoing uh, uh, engagement with local communities to ensure that the project is not starting off with 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 um, with the wrong foot in in kind of creating wrong perceptions, creating a kind of enlarged expectations, uh, broken channels of, of communications, and also as we heard again from Onwenobi is is ensuring there is consent, uh, there is informed consent, there is. Uh, 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 prior there's free consent from the local communities about what is happening in their land, in their resources. Um, and as a, uh, as a consequence of that is also ensuring the fair distribution of, of the benefits. Um, I, I'm aware there's, there's big debate here about, uh, I think Ricardo makes a very crucial point about national planning and where these projects fit into, into the larger kind of national infrastructure. Um, um, but again, I think one of the key issues in, in corporate social responsibility and ensuring that these projects are conflict sensitive is looking to delivering uh, equal uh, or equitable even uh, a distribution of, of benefit for local communities. Um, I don't think we, we, we can still argue in the 21st century that energy produced in one particular area of of Kenya or of DRC or, or of Ethiopia can go into the capital without benefiting local communities whose lands and water and, and other resources are being uh, drained and they do not get to benefit from this from this electricity. So I think that I think we can all agree on that on that principle. Um, but I do think that we do still have to to. Uh, uh, invest in understanding what are these corporate social responsibilities, environmental responsibilities when it comes to conflict? What are the intersectionalities? How can we understand those areas a bit better? Uh, 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 because this hasn't been done as much <clears throat> uh, uh, with a green energy transition, uh, with a green energy investment, sorry. Um, and I think probably the last principles before, before I can maybe share a couple of best practices is, um, but I think investors who are uh, 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 pouring money into those projects, as well as donor, donor governments who are also investing in uh, uh, mitigation uh, 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 pro uh, 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 projects, need to understand that they have responsibility over, over the social impact, over the conflict impact of this project, especially because as we've heard from Honorable Naomi, as we heard from uh, Sir John, that many of these countries there are either a weak governance or, or lack of any governance framework to uh, ensure all these areas are, are covered uh, and that companies do uh, adhere to these to these different principles so it, this is important that just because there is a legal uh, 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 framework that does not mean the the companies or the investors do not have responsibility it, it's on the opposite, it increases their responsibility to step up uh, to ensure the harm is not, is not done. So I'll, I'll take maybe a couple more minutes just to maybe share a few best practices into how uh, this can materialize. Uh, uh, um, how can we ensure that renewable energy projects are actually delivering both on the environmental targets that, that we all want them to deliver on, but also ensure that they're conflict sensitive, that they're also delivering on social cohesion, benefiting of communities. So we talked about conflict sensitive business practice. I think um, it's just, this is essential first for, for businesses and investors to uh, first 
conduct conflict analysis as part of their due diligence. This is this is at the bare minimum, um, and that conflict analysis therefore informs the design of that project, informs the design of any support mechanisms like grievance mechanisms, like local community engagement, but should also informs other other aspects like how does the company do procurement uh, of the different services. How do they do recruitment? And we've heard example in Kenya of how the company were using the kind of divide, divide and rule kind of tactics in order to work around the issues in communities. And you know, I think that's one of the key causes of conflict is when recruitment takes place of, of foreign, foreign uh, laborers that were brought in and that creates all sort of tensions. So it's, it's essential that any companies operating in areas affected by conflict, the first thing to do is to conduct a conflict analysis as part of their due diligence uh, to inform, uh, 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 inform the company about the context they're operating in and understand the impacts that the project can be having. Um, but that's not only for companies and for investors, it's also for regulators. Uh, we are seeing a movement towards uh, regulating uh, for human rights and environmental due diligence. Um, and only last week, the European Parliament, uh, through their jury, with the legal committee, have passed a proposal uh, uh, to be voted on in the coming couple of weeks. And that includes um, um, a provision for heightened due, due diligence in areas affected by conflict and fragility. And what that means is demanding uh, that businesses uh, would conduct conflict analysis as part of their due diligence. Um, and I think that's going to also have a knock-on effect in other regions, not only in the EU. We're going to see also national governments following suit to, um, to be able to kind of have a framework that is suitable with, with the European framework. Um, but as Honourable Naomi mentioned, I think there's a need for many governments around the world to ensure there are more substantial national framework and national legislations around these areas uh, so that companies and and their supply chain and value chains are adhering to these key to these key principles um, i think and and the, the the other example or the other best practice that i want to talk about is um some sort of a multi-stakeholder um uh, uh, environment in which there is an inclusive process between governments, local governments, the companies, and different communities who live in that area. Um, and the key, the key word here is trust. I think uh, uh, and that's, that's the case in, in many aspects of normal life. But one key element here is that there is a trust developed between all these different stakeholders and that this trust and this platform enables some sort of um, excuse me, uh, some sort of conflict resolution mechanisms to be dealt with within those structures rather than it uh, exploding into the street, exploding into violence, into writing, or going into court procedures, or halting the project operations, or any other kind of harmful uh, aspects uh, um, that we've seen so many times. Uh, so I think all these different stakeholders, and, and I think we're privileged here to have representatives from all of them. And I'll be I'll be keen to hear that probably in our in our questions time of how do they see that working out to create this inclusive environment whereby dialogue takes place, whereby trust is fostered and developed, uh, and that also models um, frameworks for uh, community participation and decision making, which is often lacking in those in those countries. Um, so these these kind of spaces can create models for. For, for that dialogue and for that decision-making to be taking place uh, 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 by the communities. Um, and maybe finally, uh, just very, very briefly, I think I mentioned earlier about investors and donors. I think one thing that we're not seeing very much of is um, increased collaboration between climate teams or climate units within uh, investors, for example, within DFIs, uh, uh, or, or even within government donors. Uh, and, and the kind of that collaboration with fragility and conflict teams. They're often operate in silos and they don't talk together. And I think what we need to do is to break that silo so that these investments are, are, are kind of having in mind the dual objectives of peace and, and environment. 
uh, from the outset that this is planned for. And I think Honorable Naomi mentioned that, that we need to have multiple SDGs in our objectives to plan for, for these projects. Um, and when it's, when it's that done at the earlier stages of investment, then it trickles down easier to companies and operations and, and, and engaging with local communities and government. So I'll stop, I'll stop there for the sake of time. And perhaps we can come back to some of these questions in, in the question time. Great. Thank you very much um, for what addressed a number of actors and a, different, a number of levels in which affect this issue from you know, international regulation to national to the role of development banks to local, local engagement and multi-stakeholder multi processes. So speaking of time, I think technically we only have three minutes left. Um, I have not um, seen any questions from, from the floor in the chat. So what I'm going to start with is ask um, maybe just uh, your fellow panelists to, to have a couple of concluding remarks, just a minute or so, um, um, on anything you would like to react to in terms of what you've heard this afternoon or you'd like to add. Um, I'm, I'll leave it. Uh, uh, um, yes, uh, I don't. Uh, please, um, we can go in order of the speakers if that helps. Uh, would you like to say something, John? Uh, yes, yeah, Katrina, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, I I enjoy um, listening to the discussion a lot, and uh, I think there are a lot to also con consider. And um, also, thanks to Najib uh, for like trying to connect these things um, so that it's like um, not into pieces, but make more sense when we are talking about uh, maximizing, you know, clean energy sectors. So um, yeah, in, in Myanmar context, uh, I, I would say like, these are really about, you know, political question of how energy sector is governed by who and for who. And I think local communities, you know, national authorities, uh, play key roles in, in this and, and also connected to, you know, you know, technical question of like, is there any other alternative renewable energy options? Yes, there are a lot in our country. And are there any legal or policy mechanisms uh, to support this? Um, this is a very big question right now. And how are we going to do about it financially and technical support for these uh, initiative? And, and I think um, this is a very big question. Uh, and I think um, you know, business sectors can play a big role in this. And uh, the biggest question I would say is that about what about sustainability? And, 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 uh, and I also hear Nijit was saying about this. So we cannot separate this political and technical aspects. They are interconnected to one another. And, 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 you know, like these big hydropower dams are causing human rights violations. So we need to, you know, like in our context, we need to decentralize energy sector. It cannot be like one group of people controlling the whole thing. And, and, and we move towards energy democracy. And, and we need to support more of like small scale local energy projects led by community, led by people. And I think everyone have different role to play in this interlinked uh, in this whole transition to climate friendly and and people energy sector, and like I mentioned before, you know, but Burma is under military control and everything is like wars, including the the energy sector. So we need to get back back to the people, you know, power back to the people, and this is important for us to make sure people manage and control energy sector. So when we talk about company to engage to engage with local communities. We are not talking about like one or two consultation, you know, meetings, or, or one or two projects. But we are talking about uh, making sure we address all aspects of the issue, so that we are talking about sustainability of energy sector. Like Niji mentioned, you know, the conflict um, analysis and you know all these things, so we can have meaningful engagement. Uh, you know, so I would like to invite uh, invite investor and companies to invest in people community-based renewable energy initiative so that we have meaningful engagement uh, and, and also people become more stronger toward engaging in decision-making process in, in this energy sector. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Now I realize our time is up. And so it's absolutely understandable if people have to drop off. At, at the same time, I don't want to be unfair. And I certainly would like to give the opportunity for Honorable Naomi to, if, if you'd like to have a, a closing uh, remark, and this, I will offer the same opportunity to the others. Honorable Naomi, I uh, think you Yes. Yes. Th thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I have enjoyed the meeting and the interactions. I've learned some new things. And mine is just to say that there is great need of uh, people to invest in peace building and green energy, um, and uh, especially in uh, most parts of our country. Um, this meeting has been very important, and mine is just to encourage for another meeting so that we can discuss it further and also encourage investors who are ready to come and invest. Thank you so much and have a good time. Thank you too. Um, and Ricardo, would you, would you like to say a few closing words? Um, sure, not. I, think, um, I think that just to step out of my sort of perspective, I mean, if you, you can do things that are sustainable and that are renewable, at a localized level, I think it's possible we do it. Um, but when you zoom out and when you run a country, then you need to think of national system bankability and sustainability. I do think today that perhaps not the entire, especially I think on a global scale, we need to look to renewables. Um, I think that that is not and should not be an undue burden for developing countries. So if they have a cheaper way to support their energy mix, I think they have every right to explore that way. Uh, but I do think that renewables may, at a centralized level, may cause some conflict. I mean, listening to a Myanmar uh, example, but, but inevitably, and history has shown time and time again, that it is a lesser conflict than what would be caused by a continued dependence on fossil fuels, um, as well as a lesser cost. So I do think that there's a big difference between providing services to a couple of communities uh, and not to not to simplify or dumb down what I do on a daily basis, but that is one thing. And another thing is providing universal energy access at a national level where uh, the interest of the country sometimes must take precedence to interest of the few. That said, that said, uh, it should be done in a consultative process um, with, with all due uh, checks and balances as well as compensations where, where necessary and never through through violence of course but but when you when you sit in the back end of, of the national utility you see that it is very very difficult uh, and when you're in the treasury of a government that has uh, no funding it is even more difficult and so compromises i think i think the point is that consultation doesn't only mean rights it also means obligations and compromise and i think that that is the only way that you can iterate towards a more sustainable solution that's more inclusive um, but but other than that, I do think that today we have the technology um, and, and the funding. Uh, what you need is political willingness, um, and some countries have exhibited that to deliver an accelerated access to modern services uh, to rural and underserved areas. Um, so yeah, I'd like to finish with a, a positive note and say that uh, we can we can hope for an acceleration of progress in that direction in the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Najib, would you like to have a final word? Uh, thank you, Katrina. I'll, I'll probably very briefly maybe finish with what I started with. I think it's essential that we are, we do continue with transitioning to greener and more renewable energy. But I think it's essential that we do get this right uh, for the sake of the planet, but also for the sake of the people uh, who are affected most by, by climate change. And I think, again, now also following on Ricardo's positive note, I think we can do that. We do have the resources and we do have the experience. I think the only thing we do need is the willingness to do it. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, I would just like to emphasize that I agree with all of those statements. Uh, we are an endowed foundation. We're also an investor in these sectors. And for us, it's very clear that we need to enable investment and also um, encourage 
the investment in the social side of these things, which also costs. Um, so I think we all have a role to play in that. Also NGOs, all the, num all the actors you've mentioned, certainly government, certainly international regulation. Um, I just want to thank you very, uh, in a heartfelt way, for your sharing your time, your experience, uh, which is vast, and uh, it's been, I've learned a lot, and I also want to thank all those that didn't have a voice, as in couldn't speak on this Zoom, Zoom call, but listened in and stayed with us for such a long time. Thank you all. It was very, it was very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.